Welcome back students. Now that we have an understanding of variables, independent and dependent variables, and the idea of testing a hypothesis, a conjectural uh, statement that specifies a directional relationship between two variables, the independent and dependent variables, we have to move on to thinking about the idea of control. So here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to look at what control variables are, we're going to consider sources of spuriousness, we're going to identify possible sources of spuriousness, then we're going to look at antecedent variables, intervening variables, and conditional variables. So let's get started. Testing a hypothesis involves showing that the independent and dependent variable vary together, or co-vary, in a consistent patterned way. For example, showing that people who have higher levels of education do tend to have higher levels of political interest. But it's never enough to demonstrate an empirical association between the independent and dependent variable. We must always go on to look for other variables that might plausibly alter or even eliminate the observed relationship. Control variables are variables whose effects are held constant, or literally controlled for, while we examine the relationship between the independent and dependent variable. Let me give you an example. This example comes from How to Lie with Statistics by Daryl Huff. Somebody once went to a good deal of trouble to find out if cigarette smokers make lower college grades than non-smokers. It turned out that they did. This pleased a good many people, and they've been making much of it ever since. The road to good grades, it would appear, lies in giving up smoking and, to carry the conclusion one reasonable step further, smoking makes dull minds. This particular study was, I believe, properly done, sample big enough and honestly and carefully chosen, correlation having high significance, and so on. The fallacy is an ancient one, which has a powerful tendency to crop up in statistical material, where it is disguised by a welter of impressive figures. It is the one that says, if B follows A, then A has caused B. An unwarranted assumption is being made that since smoking and low grades go together, smoking causes low grades. Couldn't it just as well be the other way around? Perhaps low marks drive students not to drink but tobacco. When it comes right down to it, this conclusion is about as likely as the other and just as well supported by the evidence, but it's not nearly so satisfactory to the propagandists. It seems a good deal more plausible, however, that neither of these things produce the other, but both are a product of some third factor. Can it be that the sociable sort of fellow who takes his books less seriously is also likely to smoke more? Or is there a clue in the fact that somebody once established a correlation between extroversion and low grades, a closer relationship apparently than the one between grades and intelligence? Maybe extroverts smoke more than introverts. The point is, when there are many reasonable explanations, you're hardly entitled to pick the one that suits your tastes and insist upon it, but many people do. So to avoid falling for the post hoc fallacy and thus winding up believing many things that are not so, you need to put any statement of a relationship through sharp inspection. Let's consider potential sources of spuriousness. As you look at these five examples, there is a relationship between all of them. However, an unobserved third variable is actually causing both of the variables. For example, there's a correlation between pollution rates and literacy rates. Is pollution causing people to be better readers? There's a correlation between the number of firefighters and the amount of fire damage in any given county. Are firefighters causing the fire damage? There's a strong relationship between the amount of ice cream sold and the number of deaths by drowning observed. There's a relationship between shoe size and reading performance for elementary school children, and the number of homicides and the number of churches. All of these examples, silly examples granted, can be explained if you consider the source of spuriousness. A source of spuriousness is causing both the independent and the dependent variable. So for example, industrialization is causing both pollution and literacy rates. The size or the population density of a county is causing both the number of firefighters to be hired and the amount of fire damage. Temperature is increasing both ice cream sales and the likelihood that someone swims. As children get older, their feet get larger, and as children get older, they become more proficient at reading. And similar to our firefighters example, more dense counties will have more churches and more murders.
A source of spuriousness is a variable that causes both the independent variable and the dependent variable. When you remove the common cause, the observed relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable weakens or disappears. So to identify a potential source of spuriousness, you have to ask yourself whether there's any variable that might be a cause of both the independent and the dependent variable, and whether that variable acts directly on the dependent variable as well as the independent variable. So let's think about this example. The higher a person's income, the greater their interest in politics. Is there a variable that causes both someone's income and how interested they might be in politics? And a variable, for example, such as education, might, pl might plausibly explain both income and interest in politics. Now, to be a source of spuriousness, it has to act on both the independent and the dependent variable. If it acts on the independent variable only, it is not a source of spuriousness, it is an antecedent variable. It just comes before. Once we've searched for sources of spuriousness, we still want to think about other ways in which we can elaborate the relationship. So let's think about an intervening variable. An intervening variable is variables that mediate the relationship between the independent and dependent variable. An intervening variable often provides an explanation as to why the independent variable affects the dependent variable in the way that it does. The intervening variable corresponds to the assumed causal mechanism. The dependent variable is related to the independent variable because the independent variable affects the intervening variable and the intervening variable then in turn affects the dependent variable. To identify a plausible intervening variable, ask yourself why you think the independent variable would have a causal impact on the dependent variable. So let's take a look at this examine. Women are more likely to favor an increase in social spending than are men. Now we have an independent variable of gender and a dependent variable of social spending, and you have to ask yourself why it is that women would favor an increase in spending in social spending more so than men. And possibly you might come up with some sort of solution that would suggest that women are more likely to be reliant on the welfare state. They're more likely to visit physicians. They're more likely to be the head of single parent households, etc. Good. Once we've identified intervening variables, perhaps we want to think about what's called a conditional variable. So we've eliminated plausible sources of spuriousness, we've verified the assumed causal mechanism, and let's think about the conditions under which our hypothesized relationship holds. This might help us elaborate our theory. So ideally, we want there to be as few conditions as possible because the aim is to come up with a generalization, but nevertheless, we might want to consider some conditions if we think that they're important to elaborate our theory. Conditional variables are variables that literally condition the relationship between the independent and dependent variable. They can affect the strength of the relationship between the independent and dependent variable, i.e. how well do values of the independent variable predict values of the dependent variable, and they can also affect the form of the relationship between the independent and dependent variable, i.e. which values of the dependent variable tend to be associated with which values of the independent variable. So to identify plausible conditional variables, you have to ask yourself whether there are some sorts of people who are likely to take a particular value on the dependent variable regardless of their value on the independent variable. Now let's note that the focus is always on how the hypothesized relationship is affected by different values of the conditional variable. There are basically three types of variables that can condition relationships. Variables that specify the relationship in terms of interest, knowledge, or concern, for example, a relationship might hold if someone is interested, but not hold if they're not interested. Or a relationship might hold in terms of time or place, where under some conditions, at some times, a relationship that you observe might be present, and at other times, it might not. For example, in the early to mid-1970s, shortly after Watergate, the anything related to cynicism or trust in government was very different than it might be today, and so there might be a time effect. You might want to condition on the time at which you have observed the data. Finally, you might want to condition relative to the social background characteristics of someone, the demographics like race, gender, ethnicity, language, etc.
All right, let's take a look at an example of a conditional relationship. Catholics are more likely to oppose abortion than are Protestants or those of other religious faiths. Now, that's a good hypothesis, but then if you think about a conditional relationship, you need to think about, is it possible that this rel religious affiliation predicts how much someone supports abortion under some circumstances, but doesn't under other circumstances? And the example that we've come up with here is possibly church attendance. Perhaps the relationship holds amongst those who attend church, but does not hold amongst those who do not attend church. Very good. So we've covered a lot of ground here. We've looked at what are control variables. We've looked at potential sources of spuriousness. We've identified sources of spuriousness. We've looked at antecedent, intervening, and conditional variables. Fantastic, students. You're doing outstanding. The next thing we're going to cover is bibliographies, annotated bibliographies, and how we research our research questions. We'll see you soon.